So in this video, we're going to take a look at the different addressing types that exist inside of ARM as well as other assembly languages. And the general idea of addressing types is that they're ways that we're able to store and retrieve data from the various memory locations that we have. So for example, in the previous video, we used a type of addressing that is known as um, immediate addressing. And that's when we want to move into a register, a specific value that is constant. So whenever we have like a constant value, like this five on this side being moved into a register R0, we call this immediate addressing because we're taking an immediate value and we're placing it into a register. A similar type of register type movement that we have is moving between two different registers. So if I want to move now what's in R0 into R1, this would be called register direct addressing. So we're directly moving a value from one register into another. So those are two types of addressing that we have that work with the register memory. And they're mo the most common ones that we'll typically see when we're working with registers. Now, the more interesting type of addressing that we have has to deal with data that's stored in the stack. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to get data onto the stack first, and then we'll take a look at how we can work with the data that's on the stack. So first off, how do we get data onto the stack? To do this, we have to use a data section in our application. And the way that we do that is we just type in dot data. This is going to come below all of our like global start portion here. So you say I put it just right down here. And what we're going to do is we're going to declare any data that we want to put in our stack memory. And we do this in the way of giving it a label, which basically functions like a variable name. We then declare the type of the variable and then the data that's actually stored inside of it. So for example, I'm going to declare some data. I'm going to name the data list. So I'm going to put list colon. And then I'm going to go to the next line. And I usually like to indent to put the next portion here just to organize it nicely. Um, and in this case, I want to store a list of numbers. So in this case, when we're dealing with numbers, numbers are going to be a specific size. In this case, I want to work with 32 bit numbers. And as we've discussed, 32 bits is considered to be a word. So I'm going to type in dot word. This tells it that every single one of the values that follows should be treated as a word type, which means that they are 32 bits in size. Notice that we don't say like it's an integer or it's a float or anything like that. Um, assembly is very basic. It's basically just got those, those basic sorts of data types. Usually you're going to see things like ASCII or you're going to see things like um, the actual size, like word or half word or byte or something like that. So in this case, um, now we can just start listing off the numbers we want to put inside of our list. So um, I'll just put some, some random numbers in. Uh, it doesn't really matter what numbers you use. I'm putting in some, some positives and some negatives so you can see the different types that exist. Now, the very first thing that I need to do is I need to be able to retrieve where this list is located in memory. And what we do is we typically look for the first entry in the list, and then everything is going to follow sequentially from there. And basically what's going to happen is that they're going to appear in every single like slot in memory sequential from the first one. So you'll see that when we actually load up this program. So in order to get the first memory location into a register, uh, we want it in a register so that we can actually um, work with it and manipulate it. It's easier to work in the registers than it is to work in the stack. So we want to get it into the register first. And to do this, we're going to use an instruction known as LDR. And what LDR lets us do is it lets us load data from stack into registers. That's the main purpose of it. So I'm going to load into register R0 the location of the first value in our list variable. So this equals list indicates that I'm dealing with this list in my data section. And what it's going to do is it's going to find out where this first value is located, and it's going to place it into register 0. This is known as direct addressing, um, and this is how we essentially initialize the location of our list. So let's compile and load and see what happens. I'm going to go ahead and step into this LDR instruction, and we're going to see that it's going to store the value 8 into the register R0. So what does that mean? It means that if I come into memory, and I go over to memory location 8, so this is 0, this is 4, this is 8 right here, you can see that this looks like the start of my list. So if we look, we have 4, 5, negative 9, 1, 0, 2, negative 3. So I've got 4, 5. This might look a little bit weird. It helps to switch over our view here in our settings to decimal signed to see it a bit more clear. You can see that that's negative 9. 
Um, just as a little reminder, the reason why we see it like this is because it's stored in two's complement, right? So we have all the Fs, which is all of the ones, and then the actual number there, right? So you can see that that's generally how that's stored, um, but this helps us see it a little bit more clear. So you can see that these are all of the entries inside of our list. So that's, that's nice and easy to look at. And now we actually have the location of the first value in our list. So that's nice that we have that location. The next question is, well, how do we actually retrieve the value from that location? And the answer is that we have to use another type of addressing mode, and this one is known as register indirect addressing. And the way that that works is that we still use LDR because we're moving from the stack into the register. And what I'm gonna do in this case is I'm gonna load into register R1 the value that exists at the address of R0. So these square brackets tell our assembler that we're really looking to find the value associated with the address in R0. So when we compile and load this, what's gonna happen is, in this case, we get um, 10 as our value in R0, or 10. So um, you can see that it changes every time that I compile and run it. That's totally normal. Um, every single time that you run it, the memory structure will be slightly different, which is why we sort of have to do more dynamic loading like we're doing rather than hard coding numbers in. So that's just something to note as well. So you can see that R0 is equal to 10. We come into memory, we can see that indeed um, 10 does look to be the location of the first element. When we do our next instruction, this LDR um, R1 and then the square brackets R0, what it does is it takes a look and it says, okay, well in R0 we have this value here. And then what it will say is it will say, okay, let's go to that memory address. What's stored in that memory address? Okay, four is stored in that memory address, so we'll return that back as our result. And you can see that's exactly what we get is four. So just to give you a little bit of an analogy, if you're thinking about like other programming languages, it always helps to think about this sort of like in a high level world as well. Um, in a lot of programming languages, you might have like a list. Um, you know, I could do like a, a Python like list for instance, and we can have like our different values like this. And what we're doing with this, um, with this uh, register indirect addressing is we're basically just trying to find the lists value at i, where i is r0. So it's really like the list value at R0. That's basically what we're looking to do with this. So that's just something to note. Now, there are other ways that we can access values off of this list. One such way would be to use register indirect with an offset. What an offset does is it starts with the value in R0. So for example, in this case, it's currently 10. It adds some offset to it and then retrieves the value. So for instance, what I could do is I could add four to it because if I add four to it, that would take me to the next location in memory. Remember this is 10, this is um, 14 here. So I can add four to it to get to the next location in memory and retrieve that value. So that would be an example of something that we could do. So let's see how we actually do that. Um, we would do LDR. In this case, I'll put it into R2 in this case. Um, and we're gonna do R0, hashtag four. So what this does is it takes the value in R0, it adds the, the form to it, and then it retrieves that value. It'd be sort of like doing R0 plus one in the high level context. I do plus one here because we're just moving one index over in the list. Remember, we're doing four here because we need to add four to this address here in order to end up at this location, which is the location of the next value in memory. So that's just generally how that ends up working, right? It's four and hex for each stack location. And of course we could do other things, right? Like we, we could add eight to get to this. We can add 12 to get to this and we can keep going like that as well. Um, so that, that's just something to keep in mind with this too. And just to demonstrate to you that this really does work, let's compile and load it and let's step into it. We can see we get 10 in this case, four is the location of the first memory, and then five is what's stored at the second location. And we can confirm that that actually is true. We can see five follows from four. So we can see that that does work the way that I have explained it, which is great. So the last two types of addressing methods that we'll talk about here are known as a pre-increment and a post-increment. So I said previously that the, the first one that we have here is the same as doing like a list at R0 plus one. With a pre-increment, what we would be doing is we would be incrementing R0 and then we would be accessing the value at R0. So we essentially increment it and then we check it. 
So that's the way that a pre-increment works. So it increments before it actually gets the value. And the way that this works is we just put an exclamation mark after this. So it's the same sort of syntax. We just put an exclamation mark that indicates that this is a pre-increment now. So let's see what ends up happening. When I compile and run this, you can see that I get 10 still, four is still in this. And you can see what's gonna happen is the result's gonna be the same. We're still going to get five because it's gonna increment this by four, which would take us to location 14. In location 14, we have the value five. However, something very interesting happens that's different from the previous example, and that's that R0 changes to 14 afterwards. In the first example where we were doing just an offset, R0 didn't change. When we do a pre-increment, which has the exclamation mark at the end, it increments R0 and accesses at that specific location. So that's the way that this differs from our offset. And now finally, we'll talk about our post-increment. Our post-increment is very similar to our pre-increment, just difference in when we actually increment the value, right? It would be the same as doing an access to our list at R0 and then incrementing our R0 value one index further. And the way that this is typically written is just like this. It would be R0 and then hashtag four like this. So that's generally the way that this will end up looking. So let's compile and load that and see what happens. So you can see, again, we're at 10 as our starting location. Four ends up being our value for R1. And then for R2, we end up with the value four, and then this increments to 14. The reason why we got the value four is because remember R0 started at the beginning, which is 10, and then we ended up accessing at that location, giving us four, and then we incremented afterwards. So remember the increment comes afterwards rather than before. So that's the main thing to keep in mind with that. And that covers all of the different address loading types that we have available to us. So now you should be able to comfortably manipulate data and be able to retrieve from registers and retrieve from stack memory. And we'll use this throughout um, various other videos as we continue on learning ARM. So you'll get very familiar with these different addressing types as we work with them and you'll see a lot of good applications of them as well.